of the lineage of Christ had three sons. One of those was named Ur. The other was named Onan. And the younger was named Shelah. Well, our lesson deals with Ur, God killing him. God had to. He provoked God. So let's read, if you would. Let's read this whole story, and we're going to come back and break it down and, and uh, see what we can glean from it. God gave the story to us, the record. And since he gave it to us, I believe we should utilize it. Okay. Top of your page. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, his oldest son, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord slew him. The Lord, God killed him. The scripture says, don't provoke the Lord. Don't provoke God. Uh, life is in his hands. He can give it, he can take it. That's what Job said, he giveth and he taketh away. But God killed Ur. Judah said then unto his second son, unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother, in Ur's honor and memory. Verse 9. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he had a relationship, when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it, the seed, on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. <coughs> he didn't want to raise a child to his brother's <coughs> namesake. That didn't please the Lord. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore God slew Onan also. I have a friend, Baptist preacher name. Uh, uh, he and I did church directors together for years. The only fellow I ever knew in life that was named after this guy Onan. He said, I got a Bible name. I said, yeah, but look what Onan did. But you know, uh, people are determined. And I say this jokingly, but it's true that to me it's a joke. There was a football player. His mother named him a Bible name. His name was Second Corinthians. I'm not kidding you. It's a guy with that name, 2 Corinthians. But be careful when you name somebody a Bible name. Now, I hope nobody here this morning is named Reuben. Uh, people are named Reuben, and I, we had a friend uh, by that name, passed on now. But you know what Reuben means, do you not? It means unstable. Do you want to name your child unstable? No. <laughs> but I see people coming up with all kinds of new names today, and I wonder if they ever search the meaning out before they're hanging on their kid. Anyway, God killed Ur, and now he's killed Onan because Onan didn't want to impregnate his new wife. So God... Killed him also. Verse 11. Now look what happened. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow. Go back to your daddy's house, at thy father's house, till Sheila, my son, be grown. My boy's not grown yet. For he said, Lest peradventure he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. In the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. Judah, the old man, now his wife, has died. And Judah was comforted. 
And he went up into his sheep shear to Timnath, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. She, Tamar, put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is, by the way, to Timnath. For she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given unto him to wife. Hey, that boy, I supposed to be his wife. And Judah hadn't taken care of that. So she said, I'm going to take care of, what, of the situation. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, Judah comes along here, sets a woman out by the uh, side of the road. He thought her to be an harlot or a prostitute because he had covered, she had covered her face. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. Let's have a relationship. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law, and she said, he made a proposition to her. She said, What will thou give me? that thou mayest come in unto me. If you want a relationship, what's it worth to you? Judah said, I'll send there a kid from the flock. I'll give you a goat. She said, will thou give me a pledge? i got to have some kind of collateral. Till thou send it, till you send the goat. Verse 18, and he said, Judah said, what pledge shall I give thee? She said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And he gave it her and came in unto her. Oh, and she conceived by him. She became pregnant. She arose and went away and laid by her veil from her and put on the garments of her widowhood. Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But he found her not. She wasn't there anymore. Well, he had promised her that he would give her a goat, or a kid, a young goat. But he can't give it to her if he can't find her. She's not there. Judah sent the kid by, verse 20, by the hand of a friend, the Dulamite, to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Then Judah asked the men of the, that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? They said, There's no harlot in this place. He returned to Judah and said, I can't find her. And also the men of the place said there was no harlot in this place. It was his daughter-in-law. Judah said, let her take it to her. Let her just keep it. Lest we be ashamed. Behold, I'll send this kid, and thou hast not found her. Uh-oh. Verse 24. See what happens. And it came to pass about three months after this happened. That it was told Judah, saying, Tamar thy daughter-in-law hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by a whore. She's been a whore, and she's now pregnant. And Judah said, Bring her forth, and let her be burned. Boy, that's harsh judgment, isn't it? Burn that woman! Because she's done that. She, she's been a a whore. He forgot about the whore monger, didn't he? Right. Because that's what he was. Three months later, and he said, Bring her and let her be burnt. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father in law, saying, Oh, oh, what we got here? 
By the men who these are, the signet and the bracelets, But the person that owned these things is the father of the baby. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet, the bracelet, and staff. Judah was in trouble. He just said, Burn this woman. And he was the one that got her pregnant. Judah acknowledged them. He said, they're mine. But listen to this confession. And she said, she had been, he said, she had been more righteous than I because I gave her not to Sheila, my son, as I had agreed to. And he knew her again no more. Well, he made a bad judgment, didn't he? Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when we judge. Let God judge, okay? <coughs> but Judah walked after the flesh. Somebody said, well, his wife had died and he was lonesome. That's correct. He was lonesome. He didn't have anybody right now. But he comes along and pays this woman. Promises her a goat. He sees her out there, and he assumed that she was a prostitute. But it was his daughter-in-law. She had camouflaged herself. He didn't care who she was. He just wanted a woman. That was the case. Had no thoughts for her feelings or whatever. He walked after the flesh. And this was a man that's supposed to give us and did indeed give us a Savior. Jesus came through the lineage of Judah. And by the way, when Judah got her pregnant, she had twins, twin boys. And I'm going to bring a message to the Lord willing on those two guys. One of them was named Pharaoh, the other one named Zero. But can you imagine when she, Tamar, showed him the signet, and the three things here that belonged to him? Can you imagine his blood pressure? Because he just said, put her to death. And now he confesses he was worse than her because he made a judgment about her. We all make hasty judgment, don't we? The Lord said don't answer matter before you hear it. That's why when they have a trial, they'll sit down and both give both sides of the story, don't they? And they'll sit down and discuss the matter and they'll hear it. But a fool judges hastily. Let's not judge our brother. It's our job to help him, not judge him. Let's not judge the world. Let's not try to be the world's judge. Leave that to God. God will take care of his business. Matter of fact, there's a story that I'm going to take time to turn and read. It. I didn't print it on the paper, but if you have your Bible, turn to uh, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 34. This is during the time the apostles were being persecuted greatly because they were preaching the name of Christ. And we've learned a whole lot about cults and so forth right here in these scriptures. What happens to cults? Verse 34 of Acts chapter 5. Acts 5 verse 34. Then stood there up one of the council of Pharisee named Gamaliel, 
a doctor of the law, but he knew the Old Testament. He had a reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little plate. They had the apostles were taken uh, captive. He said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourself that ye intend to do as touching these men. You fellows be careful before we hurt these apostles of the Lord. For be for these days rose up Judas. And what those cult leaders listen. Boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who were slain and all as many as obeyed him were scattered, brought to naught. The Lord destroyed those 400 of the cult leaders, cult followers. Mind you, what happened to Jim Jones down here, doesn't he? 400 in this case. And then he goes further, verse 37. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of taxing and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. Now these are the things we want to remember. What he, what Gamaliel says next year. Now I say unto you, refrain from these men, these apostles, and let them alone. Remember this: if this counsel or this work be of men, it'll come to naught. If if this is all by men, artificial, it'll come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Folk, you can't fight against God. And to him they all agreed. And when they had called the apostles they beat, and had beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. If you fellows are just shut up, go on, that you can't speak in the name of Jesus. Uh, a couple of days ago on the news, and folks, this is what I'm about to tell you, gives Christianity a bad name. One of the TV preachers, by the name of Cleflo Dollar, y'all know him, you've seen him before, asked his church this week, for $65 million so he could get a newer jet. The old one beginning to wear a little bit. A private jet. $65 million. When he preaches a lie. How do we know he preaches a lie? You look at the, that's saith the Lord. Amen. Yep. Somebody said, well, don't talk about other religions. Oh, other religions is what put Jesus to death. It was the religious group, the Pharisees, that said, crucify Jesus. Right. You have to expose false religion. Amen. But the truth itself sits alone, doesn't it? Anything that's not of the truth Shows up. We're not to judge when something goes against thus saith the Lord. God has made the judgment, not us. As Brother Enrique brought out in Sunday school this morning, he goes by what the Bible says. And if the Bible says something's wrong, that means God said it. And we're not going to change it. You might ignore it. You might not believe it. But that doesn't change what God has said. But folk, God does not make mistakes. When he had Gamaliel to stand up and uh, make his speech here in the Acts chapter 5 we just read. And he told them about those cult leaders. 
that would come to naught. And folk, we've got plenty of them. Let God be the judge. And if God says something wrong, it's wrong. The Lord said, judge not that ye be not judged. If you see something that uh, you think is, uh, has a question mark on it, well, don't judge it too quick. You try it by how? By the word of God. The Lord said you'll know a tree by its fruits. So be fruit inspectors, okay? Judah repented after he had gotten his daughter-in-law pregnant, not knowing, he thought she was a prostitute. He repented. Sometimes we all need to repent, don't we? That's what John the Baptist said down at the River Jordan, wasn't it? Jesus himself said, repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. But folk, let me say again to you, it's not our job to judge the world. It's our Lord's job. In his first trip to this earth, he came not to judge, but rather to be judged. And he was judged by his own. The scripture says he came into his own, and his own, meaning the Jewish people, received him not. Neither did they receive him today. He came to save that which was lost in his first trip. But I've got to tell you, his second trip, he will be the judge. And that's what's called the judgment seat of Christ. And every saved person is going to kneel before that judgment seat because the scripture says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I'm going to tell you this much. You can't tell the Lord something he don't already know. <laughs> we are not the judge. He is. He's going to be one of two things to you. He's going to be your savior or he's going to be your judge. One way or another. He said himself, if I be lifted up, he meant on the cross, I'll draw all men unto me. And folks, since he is the essence and the source of life, he's got that right. We're here by his grace and his grace alone. It could be somebody here this morning, you, you've never put your personal faith in our Lord as your Lord. My friend, that's your main need. You can't afford to leave this old earth without it. You need to make peace with him.